Hey everybody, what's going on? Welcome back to another One Piece chapter review. Today, we're going to be taking a look at and going over One Piece chapter 1112. Now, I just want to apologize for a little bit. I kind of went on the same kind of break that Oda went on. When Oda went on break, I kind of took a little break myself because I have school and other things like that. So, I just want to apologize for that. But today, we're back to take a look at chapter 1112, which we had to wait three weeks for. I'm so excited to take a look at it and go over everything that happened. Uh, before we get started, if you guys could, please don't forget to leave a like down below, subscribe, and and hit the bell it helps out the channel so much helps show my videos to even more one piece fans and we get to make even more one piece content all right let's get right into chapter 1112 so for this cover page we're actually continuing the cover page story only child yamato and the holy inari shrine pilgrimage volume three this one is consider this parting gift payment for a favor i must ask you so you can see here in this cover page kinemon is giving Yamato something a kind of parting gift for a favor he must ask of her so it seems that while she's going around after she finishes this he knows that she's going to be parting because Kinemon's not going to leave Wano anytime soon he's here to stay he's here to watch after Momonosuke and be one of his uh one of his main people so he's giving this to Yamato as kind of like a parting gift he's going to ask her a favor she's going to he's going to ask her to do something for him we'll probably find out what that is next chapter on that cover page but I'm just happy that we're continuing these cover page stories I love them so much I love getting these little snippets of other places in the One Piece universe also, at the bottom of this cover page, you can see it's kind of giving us a little hint at what the title is. The title is Hard Aspect, and if you're like, if you don't really know a lot about, I would say like Japanese or usually just like anything that has to do with planets, like I do, I really don't know a lot of stuff that has to do with planets, then you wouldn't really know what this title was referring to. But at the bottom of the uh, cover, uh, the cover, you can see it says to us, in astrology, an aspect refers to the angles formed by planets in relation to each other on a birth chart or horoscope wheel. So you can see that the title is referring to probably the five elders and how they're like in a line, you know, it kind of is referring to them in that way because the five elders are the five elder planets. So they correlate to planets and they probably correlate to astrology and all that stuff. So it's really cool to see that. It's really cool how Oda uses like different numbers and different titles to kind of give us information about maybe what's in the chapter or about maybe like a hint on something that's coming forward in the future. Because I know like a lot of the times he'll use numbers and stuff, but they'll like then the way they're spelt out in Japanese actually spell like an actual word or something like that. So it's really cool how he does that. I really like it. And I just like how he's doing it here. And thank you, TCB scans for giving us a kind of clarity on what this was and uh, what it meant. Starting off the actual chapter, you can see the onslaught continues. All the Marines are still firing the Egghead. They're trying to take out as many of the Giants, Straw Hat crew, just any satellites, any Vegapunk clones, anything like that. They're trying to take everybody out as much as they can for as long as they can because they're not going to be able to do this forever. So you can see there, the Mark III pacifistas have already all been incapacitated. So St. Ethan Barron did his job. You remember in the last chapter, he was going around and he was able to slash um, these pacifistas and freeze them, not really necessarily breaking them because they want to be able to use them in the future, but they were kind of freezing them so they're not being able to be used right now. So if he, he was going around doing all that and it seems that he finally got all the pacifistas, we get that confirmed there when they said, oh, the Mark III pacifistas have all been incapacitated. So all the Mark III ones have been incapacitated, but it seems maybe like the um, S Shark and S Hint and um, all those people are still up. So all those pacifista are still up and going so we'll probably see more from them in the future but for right now all the mark three pacifistas are out for good ethan barrow then also gives us a little hint on who will be the marines like number one target going forward because before it was really like luffy they knew about the gum gum fruit and all that he was really a number one target maybe dragon he's been trying to take him out but now they have a new person to add to that list because ethan barrow says to us it'll be a disaster if jewelry bonnie gets away she's no more than a little 12 year old girl and you gave her the power to eradicate entire nations. Your defiance is as foolish as insolent, Vegapunk. And you can see there, he's probably dashing to go towards where Vegapunk is, his location with Sanji and all the other straw hats. Because I think Sanji in the last chapter, we had like a little map of what was going on. Sanji and Vegapunk are kind of towards the side of the Labo Sphere. Um, all the rest of the straw hats are kind of on top and Luffy and um, Dorian Bragi are behind it. So that's kind of where we are right now. And we need to get to the shore, which is in front of the Labo Stratum. So after that, on the next page, we actually get into a fight between Frankie and Red King. If you don't remember, Red King is that vice admiral with like the triple quadruple chins. He has like a bunch of chins. So we cut into a fight between Frankie and Red King and they're saying, out of the way, I'm not letting you through. Theme, strong, right. And you can see Frankie knocks him out, 
punches him so hard his eyes go completely white his whole face shifts so frankie it seems i would say not just frankie most of the straw hats at this point if not all of them are stronger or on the level of vice admirals frankie just beat red rock uh, red king without any problem he literally just said strong right and boom red king is done that's like and maybe if they were on the same level he would do what he did with um with senior pink because if you remember senior pink and frankie's fight they were literally like evenly matched the whole time one of them couldn't take the other one over it wasn't really an overpowered fight this is completely different ever since that fight with senior pink frankie became way stronger after frankie hits red king with that strong right we actually pan out a little bit in the same frame so you can see frankie in the background doing the strong right you can see the chains that connect to his hand are actually um out right now you can see bonnie's jumping up in the air to hit pomsky uh vice admiral pomsky and then she says to the giants hey giants take care of my dad and they say back, you bet. And then, like I said, Bonnie was jumping in the air, going to attack Pomsky. He says to her, brace yourself, Jewelry Bonnie, you stupid, miserable brat. We're not going to let you keep a single one of our war machines. And then she says back to him, he's not a weapon. My daddy is a hero, you cleft chin geezer. And it's kind of funny because he was an old man before. And instead of hitting, hitting an old man, she kind of turned him to maybe like a 10 or 11 or maybe even like 8 or 9 or something like that. He's a small child now. And then she hits him. Because don't forget, Bonnie's actually a 12-year-old girl. So her hitting like an old man doesn't really like fit well with her but like if she's hitting like a kid that's her age you know that that's actually a little better so that's kind of funny she turns him into a child and then knocks him out so pomsky is out for good now after bonnie knocks out vice admiral pomsky we cut back into the labo stratum into the video that was uh with vegapunk edison and shaka i think it was those three were in the video the pre-recorded video where they're going to explain everything that the government doesn't want them to know or maybe uh go over stuff about the ancient kingdom we actually don't know yet what vegapunk's going to talk about all we know that is that it's really crazy and it's going to change the history of the entire one piece world so we cut back into that video and they're saying to each other aren't you going to drink that vega coffee of yours don't tease me shaka it's too hot you know my tongue's sensitive as a cat. So they're still kind of talking about the coffee. They're still joking around a little bit, trying to buy time before the 10 minute timer's up. And while they're talking and while that's going on, we actually get to see St. Marcus Mars and York actually found the room that this was all recorded in. They say to each other, this is definitely the same room. There's no doubt. This is where it was filmed, but... And then Marcus Mars gets angry. He blasts the shot through the side of the building, trying to destroy everything. York screams out, Whoa! Wait a second. Don't do anything crazy. You didn't stop diddly squat. If I were Stella, I'd have made sure the broadcast nail was well hidden. Marcus Mars says back, Then I shall continue until the entire lab is vaporized. York argues back to him, That'd be a mistake. The second floor of Building B is dedicated to weapons development, and the first floor houses the power station. Not only that, but the third floor of Building C stores a number of high-pressure gas cylinders. If you damage any of those, the resulting explosion will blow punk records to smithereens. And as you can see, as she's explaining, we gotta get like a little diagram of uh, the lava stratum. We have floor one, two, three, four. Looks like floor one has three different sections, A, B, C. Floor two has the same thing. Floor three has the same. And then floor four is just that one building at the very top. So it's really cool. I like how Oda kind of does that. It gives us like a little insight and a little map of what the area kind of looks like. Like I said, the map in the last chapter that showed where all the straw hats were in relation to each other. So I really like how Oda does that. He does that a lot. And I really appreciate him because a lot of this stuff gets onto like a big scale and you kind of can't keep track where everyone is. So that's awesome that he did that. St. Marcus Mars then says back to York after she tells him all that stuff about how all this stuff can blow up, he says to her, then think of a solution. You satellites all share an identical thought process, correct? She then says back, of course, I know exactly how to stop this. Besides, we don't want to rack up any more sins. Our relationship is already troubled enough. Now, I'm pretty sure what she's talking about sins here is just talking about how each of the um, satellites is one of like the seven deadly sins, like one's like greed, one's evil, one's whatever. So they're all different seven deadly sins. Actually, which ones are they? I'll tell you right now. So Shaka has the embodiment of good. Lilith has the um aspect of evil. Edison has the aspect of thinking. Pythagoras has the aspect of wisdom. Atlas has the aspect of violence. And York has the aspect of greed. The real seven deadly sins are pride, greed, wrath, envy, lust, gluttony, and sloth. And actually, if you think about that, those are basically all of the different attributes that contribute to York. York is basically, I would say, all of that stuff. So she definitely is all of the seven deadly sins rolled in, up into one. After York talks about the sins and all that stuff, Marcus Mars senses something. You can see we get an expl explanation mark next to his face. And don't forget, these five elders do have hockey and all those types of hockey. So 
they have the, uh, I would say, some of the best observation hockey in the One Piece universe, probably. They seem like really strong characters, and them not having really strong hockey really doesn't make sense. They've all shown it. So Marcus Mars probably has really good observation hockey, especially being someone that flies a lot. So he senses a voice coming from higher up. He says to York, I sense the voice of a small life form above. She says back, you mean from Punk Records? Don't, don't tell me he hit the snail there. She then tells him, it'll be one of the broadcast snails we recently finished developing. They're shaped like this with sort of a triangle shell. He then says back, where is the entrance as he makes his way up towards punk records. After that, we cut back into the control room where everybody was before. If you don't remember, we had that big kind of two-page spread of all the straw hats, Stussy, all of the satellites, Rob Lucci, Kaku, all of them together in the same room in that one room. So it looks like the room is completely destroyed. Now, Marcus Mars destroyed the entire room, but he somehow didn't see Stussy and Kaku in there. They say to each other, what a relief, it's gone. I guess it wasn't interested in us. <laughs> the feeling is mutual. What in the blue blazes was that monster? Going off what we overheard, I think it's one of the five elders. Go figure. What a repulsive transformation. So kind of from that conversation, we know that Kaku is a part of the government, but it seems that the the different people in the government don't really respect the five elders per se. He is kind of higher up. He is CP0, and he's someone that's supposed to technically be working, I would say, directly underneath the five elders. But he's here saying, what a repulsive transformation. So even he thinks that the five elders are repulsive. Even like Rob Lucci and Kaku and all these people in CP0 think that the five elders are repulsing. So the five elders, I feel like, are going to get a real uh, rude awakening when everybody in the Marines kind of turns against them and Eam at one point. I feel like it's going to happen some sometime soon, if not towards the end of the story, everybody's going to turn on these six people. They then continue their conversation saying to each other, so why are you still here? Did your new pals leave you high and dry? I'd be downright heartbroken if it weren't for your own recent double cross. Because don't forget, Stussy was a part of the CP0 kind of crew with, um, with Rob Lucci, with Kaku. So she was kind of with them. She was on their side and she double crossed them. She was like, okay, yeah, I'm a part of the government, but no, I'm actually working for Vegapunk and all of them. So I'm not a part of the government. So he knows her. He was like good friends with her, but at the same time, she double crossed them. So he doesn't really feel as bad. She then says back, I decided to stay of my own volition. Someone needed to be here to carry out this final mission. Now, this may seem like she's sacrificing herself, and she is, but don't forget, Stussy is actually a clone of um, Weevil, who is um, supposedly Whitebeard's son's um, mother. His mother is technically the original Stussy. She was the original person who was in this group with uh, Vegapunk, with Queen, with... Um, with um with caesar clown so it seems that she the original stussy still alive she's still doing that and this stussy knows that she's a clone and knows that this is what she has to do so that's why she's willing to sacrifice herself the original stussy may not be this way because we know her as like kind of greedy she knows weevil is like the person who's supposed to have the heir to whitebeard's fortune and all that stuff but this stussy who is the clone seems a little more like like like, um, not as self-centered and stuff like that. So she's going to stay behind. And the Straw Hats actually talk about this in the next page. They say to us, hang on, we're just going to leave Stussy behind? There's no help in it. That darn barrier has to be lowered the instant the ship attempts its escape. And mind you, the Frontier Dome can only be disarmed from the command tower. The lady wanted to do it herself. We can only respect that and show our gratitude by getting out of here alive. Nami says back, of course, we won't waste this chance to escape, but... And then Robin butts it and says, the thing is, how are we meant to cover the distance that Vega Force 1 was originally going to fly us? And then Edison says back, that's the real head scratcher here, Nico Robin. According to my calculations, in all conventional wisdom, we're 100% guaranteed to crash and burn. They all scream back, seriously? Usopp then comes in telling us, guys, I finished loading the Coupe de Burst. We can take off towards the sea the second Zora and the others get on board. If we don't make it, we'll have to improvise and rely on everyone's powers to get us to get to give it our all. Edison says this back, ha ah, ha ha, wowee, this sure is a rowdy crew. We then cut into like Brooke, Lilith, and Usopp kind of hanging off the edge of the ship looking at Edison while he says, they say miracles happen because guts triumph over all. And I love that theory even if I am a scientist. So it kind of seems like he has like a country accent. He's talking like, ah, instead of I. So that's kind of funny. And then he kind of bursts down towards the kind of, I would say ground or ocean while saying, I'm gonna make sure your ship reaches the ocean. Trust me, projected damage is 78%. I ain't dying, not yet. And it seems like he explodes out the bottom of the Labo Stratum. So it seems he's probably going to sacrifice himself. Um, it seems like probably most of the um, Vegapunks are going to sacrifice themselves or die in this battle. 
I would say maybe one or two are gonna stay um stay behind and go with the straw hats. I'm pretty sure it's just gonna be Lilith. That's why I said maybe one. I'm pretty sure it's just gonna be her. All the other Vega Punks are either gonna stay here, get destroyed, or something else is gonna happen to them. Maybe they get shut down or something like that, or maybe they sacrifice themselves. But I feel like something's gonna happen to most of the satellites except for Lilith. She's the one that's gonna stay with us, and Oda kind of has to do that in a certain way. So it's probably gonna be them sacrificing themselves, kind of how Edison did here, or maybe they self destruct, or maybe they go off on their own like and do something evil like york did or maybe they kind of you know just die randomly by getting hit by something so we never know what happens or is going to happen but for right now i think that york or i mean lilith is going to be the only one that goes with us going forward and she's going to be the only one that really survives this or kind of comes with the straw hats from this after edison kind of sacrifices himself or jumps off the ship and kind of goes off and does his own thing we cut back into uh luffy dory and Broggy, who are going up against um St. Jupiter, who was the big war worm guy, and Topman Workery, who was like the big boar with like the um the big husks coming out of his face. We cut back into them, and you can see St. Jupiter is kind of sucking as much stuff as he can in, trying to eat Dory, Broggy, and Luffy. The Marines are saying, a terrible vortex is emanating from the island. And then, like I said, we cut into St. Jupiter, who is sucking in as much stuff as he can. Dory and Broggy say, what power? It's sucking us in. We're not getting anywhere. And then you can see Luffy struggling there. He goes, nee, nee, nee. and then he gets angry. He says, damn it. And he kicks this uh, building and he says, if you're hungry, try chewing on this building. And it flies towards St. Jupiter and smacks him in the mouth. And he actually like curls up into like a freaking into an accordion. He gets smashed into pieces by Luffy because don't forget gear five is super strong. And even though he gets kind of smashed into an accordion, it's supposed to be cartoonish. He did take damage. He did like, he did get hurt, but He's not actually like dead like he normally would be if he got crushed into an accordion. He's it's more of like a tune effect. After that attack, we cut into Dory and Broggy running away. They're happy, they're laughing, they're saying, Go, ga ba ba ba, this is a real thrill, ha 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 ha. And then we just cut into Luffy, who is just dead tired. He's beat, he's wheezing, he says, I'm beat. They then both look at him and, and freak out and say, What the straw hat? You look like an old man. He says back to them, I'm all out of food and power. They say to him, well, Food? Want some of our heart girl? Heart girl? And then they give him kind of this like meat looking thing and he says, what's the smell? Fermented shark. It's an emergency ration from Elbath. Gah, bah, 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 bah. It may stink, but it's tasty. And then as soon as Luffy eats it, he kind of buffs up. You can see he gets super strong. He says, whoa, that hit the spot. Gah, 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 gah. Your body's so impressive. You're back to normal. And as soon as Luffy eats this kind of shark skin and he, he powers up, we can see St. Warkery is actually charging after them. Uh, Dory says to us, the boar's charging. Luffy then goes into gear third. He leaps in the air and says, gear third, gum gum, red rock. And you can see he punches down on top of Warkery. But Warkery is not really making any kind of expression. He's not like... He's not like chomping down. He's not turning into an accordion like um, Jupiter did. He's not spitting out blood. He's not doing anything like that. The reason is Luffy actually did no damage at all to him. In the next panel, you can see Luffy's kind of confused. He's got question marks next to his head. He's saying, huh? And then we can see in the next panel, he screams out, ow! His hand is literally on fire. He's like dying. He's like, that hurts so much. He says, how hard is this guy's skin? And then he just glares at them like he's getting ready to attack again. So real quick before we get into these last two pages, because the last two pages are kind of crazy and leave us off on a big cliffhanger, I want to talk about this food that Luffy was given, this Harkle. Now, there was a lot of people online that were speculating that, oh, Luffy ate this food from Elbaf and it kind of powered him up. Does that mean that somewhere down the line, Luffy was an Elbaf person, or maybe Joy Boy was a giant and from Elbaf, and that's why Luffy's able to gear up because it goes well with gum gum fruits? But I don't think that's the case. I think it's just that maybe these um animals on Elbaf have so much like protein and so much like condensed into them because they're supposed to be feeding these giant people that when they cut them up and they kind of take their food, this harkle, it can give people a lot of protein and a lot of energy all at once because it's meant to be giving these giants kind of a boost. It's going to give these little people a big boost. So I definitely feel Joy Boy definitely ate this harkle at some point to power himself up, but was he a giant necessarily? I can't tell for sure. He could have been a giant because with the gum gum fruit, he would be able to make himself more little because when he jumps in front of the moon, he is smaller. And um, I guess we haven't really seen that yet, but it's kind of like a story. And if he was a giant, him jumping in front of the moon like that wouldn't really give off the same shadow that Luffy does. So 
if he did have the gear five fruit and he was a giant it could make sense he could shrink himself but i really don't think he was a giant i think that the only time he was a giant was when he used the gear five fruit like luffy did to make himself bigger i think maybe joy boy was just a normal person actually i don't know he could have been from elbath he had to have been from one of the main countries wano elbath um zo those are like the three countries or um he also could have been from Alabasta. Those are like the four main countries that have to do with the Old Kingdom. So he could have been from one of those four, or he could have been from his own country, which is the Ancient Kingdom. So I'm not 100% sure, but right now I'm not leaning towards the giant side. I'm leaning more towards he was probably from the Ancient Kingdom or maybe um, Alabasta or something like that. Probably not Zoe, probably not Elbath. Either I would say Wano, Alabasta, or just the Ancient Kingdom, whatever that's actually called. Okay. Now that we've gone over that, we can get into the final two pages of this chapter. So, after Luffy hits um, St. War Curry and his hand gets all hurt and he freaks out, he's like, Ah, I can't hurt him, why is his skin so hard? We cut back into the Labo Stratum back entrance, where all the Straw Hats are freaking out, they scream, Gah! We then cut into Usopp, Nami, and Chopper, and Usopp says to us, Hey, hey, hang on, w what the world? Who goes there? And then you can see three stingers start climbing up. They stab into the labo stratum. And Chopper says to us, it looks like a crab. So right then and there, you can see that St. J. Garcia Saturn is about to confront the Straw Hats. He's about to confront the Straw Hats we have here as long with Lilith. So we have Lilith, um, Brooke, Chopper, Nami, uh, Nico Robin, and Usopp here. And then Jinbei and Zoro are close by. So if anything happens to them, if they like scream or something like that happens, Zoro and Jinbei can run around the corner and probably not deal with him because even Luffy isn't able to beat them. But they'd probably be able to fend them off enough to where the Straw Hats will be able to get away. But it's not just St. Saturn that's attacking people. After this, we cut into the northeast coast where the Marines are screaming, The Giants! Ah! And after they scream, we cut into a panel with St. Ethan Barn. He's actually just all black. He's just a shadow. He kind of looks more scary than any of the um, five elders who have actually looked before. And he is standing in front of Frankie, Bonnie, and Atlas. Right now, Bonnie, I would say, is the least powerful out of all three of them because usually she has the, um, uh, the, the Seraphim to kind of protect her. But right now, she doesn't. Or not the Seraphim, the Pacifista. She usually has the Pacifista to kind of protect her, but now she doesn't. She doesn't have any of that. So all she can really do here is try to turn Ethan Barron into a child, but his hockey might be able to overpower that. So really, I would say this fight is going to be against Frankie. Frankie is going to have to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with an Admiral. Now... Do I think it's going to be Frankie? No, I don't think Frankie's going to be the one to defeat him. What I think is going to happen is, like I said, Jinbei and Sanji, or um, Jinbei is up top there with um, with um, Zoro, and Sanji and Luffy are at the bottom. Luffy and the Dorian Bragi are dealing with two of them. It's going to be Sanji, Jinbei, um, Nami, all of them dealing with um, St. Saturn. And then this one is probably going to be dealt with by, I would say, um, Sanji. And hopefully, maybe Kizaru is going to finally switch sides and try to team up with us. And he's going to help Sanji beat Ethan Baro. But that's really the only way I can see them beating him. Because Luffy is going to be struck, uh, struggling with those two that he's fighting right now. Um, the rest of the Straw Hats got to fight St. Saturn. So he's really going to be left alone to whoever's down there right now. And it's just Frankie. It's just, um, it's just uh, Lilith, um, Bonnie and Vegapunk and Sanji. So it's just going to be them unless Kizaru comes in and steps in, which I hope he does. If he does, this is going to be an awesome fight. Sanji and him get to both move at the speed of light and fight him and try to beat him. But I don't know. I don't know if he's going to. I think he might just stay in the ship and cry for the rest of the uh, arc and then maybe get released for the Marines to some point. Because, like, don't forget, he did kind of betray the Marines here. He did not put his full best effort in, the five admirals, admirals see that, or five elders see that. So they'll probably tell Akainu, Akainu will do something to him. Maybe he'll, like, suspend him. Maybe he'll, like, beat him up or something. Maybe throw him in prison for a little bit, and then he'll come off fine. Maybe they'll maybe even make a Seraphim of him, and then he'll be kicked off for good, and they just use the Seraphim as a new admiral. I don't know. Probably not. They'll probably keep him around as an admiral unless he switches sides and joins us. But right now, it seems that he's probably just going to stay crying on the ship. It's just my dr Like, I would want him to come out and help fight uh, St. Ethan Barn. But if he doesn't, that's probably going to be what happens. I'm not going to be surprised if he doesn't. And then 
After all of that, we cut back into St. Marcus Mars, who we left after he heard a strange noise coming from above in lab records. We cut into the Punk Records Labo Stratum, where we can hear the conversation between Vega Punk, Shaka, and Pythagoras, where they're saying to each other, there's only one more minute, Stella. I know, I know. We then cut into St. Marcus Mars, where we see he is walking towards a triangular shaped transponder snail, which is exactly what York said it would probably look like. And he says to us, this must be it. It seems fortune did not favor you this time, Vegapunk. And he just slowly walks towards it. Gurgle, gurgle. Gurgle, gurgle. Dot, dot, dot. Front cover and color spread. Next issue. Chapter 1112. End. And that's it. That's where we end it. Really, Oda? You're really giving us a cliffhanger after a three-week break? Oh, my God. I, like... I really wanted to see something happen, maybe get Vegapunk's speech in this chapter, maybe see something else, maybe see the Straw Hats start to get off the island, but no, he's setting up a lot of stuff for the next couple of chapters towards the end of Egghead, so we're definitely winding down at Egghead now, we're definitely past the halfway mark, we're really towards the end of it, we're getting into the fight with all the five elders, and we're trying to escape, and we're about to hear Vegapunk's message in one minute. So, everything's raveling to a close, and I just want to talk about what happened at the end here real quick with Marcus Mars, because I don't think it's going to be what um, Oda wants us to think happens so what i think oda wants us to think is that marcus mars found the transponder snail that's doing all this he's going to take it out and then vegapunk's message is not going to be heard but what i think is that this isn't the transponder snail vegapunk why would he be stupid enough to leave this transponder snail on the island why he is the smartest person in the world if i were vegapunk bring it to luffy's windmill village who cares who's going to find it on windmill village nobody and it's still going to be broadcast the entire world why does it need to be at the labo stratum you could have built an entire island just for this transponder snail on its own and nobody would ever find it because it's not on any map i don't think vegapunk would be this stupid to just leave it in the lab records or even if he did i don't think this is the end all be all once you break it the transmission breaks because he's too smart for that he's not going to do something that stupid it's like basically having a self-destruct button you break this the whole thing self-destructs nobody hears the speech so I really don't think Marcus Mars is going to be able to stop the speech. Maybe he does. Maybe he does stop the speech and we actually don't get to hear it. And that's like a crazy twist. It's like, oh my God, we all thought we were going to hear what Vegapunk had to say, but it actually got cut short. And now we have to figure out another time, which would be kind of annoying because we've gone this far into the story. Like, can we, we, we deserve to know some stuff. And if this happened, I mean, I would be a little annoyed, but it's like, hey, I mean, I guess. But I really don't think that Vegapunk left this transponder snail here for um, then to find and break and then destroy the whole thing. I think it's got to be somewhere else or the transmission will keep going, uh, still keep going even after this is broken, something like that. This isn't going to be the end of the transmission. We're going to hear what Vegapunk says 100%. I believe it. What do you guys think? Are we going to hear Vegapunk's speech in the next chapter or is it going to be two or three chapters from now? Let me know down in the comments below. Also, I just want to say again, I'm so sorry for the three week break. I'll try to let you guys know ahead of time now, but like when Oda went on that three week break, I kind of was like, okay, I got some schoolwork. I got to finish. I got to do some other stuff right now. I got to work a little bit more. So I kind of, kind of put this on the back burner and was doing all that. But now I'm back to one piece uh, YouTube videos. I'm going to be coming out with more gaming videos this week. I have my, what is Blackbeard doing video coming up and my, who is Shanks video coming up. So stay Stay tuned for all those and like i said in the beginning please don't forget to leave a like down below subscribe and hit the bell helps out my channel so much show my video to even more one piece fans and we get to make even more one piece content and i'll see you all next time peace